Hey, this is Samara, signing on with some more of Gone Home. Okay, so last time we... I decided to um, come back to this to start looking for things I missed and start analyzing things more, but also listening to the, um, you know, creator commentary, and it's actually been filling in a lot of other blanks and interesting little details that I didn't notice. And so I'm just discovering new things, finding little details that... You know, I'm just appreciating this game more and more the more I play. And we n haven't even gotten to, like, the big thing I read about that I really wanted to just get into. And that's kind of why I was started doing this, but we'll get there. So we're just learning more about the family, more about, like, little details in the game and, you know, everybody else. Uh, where would be a good place to start? Okay, maybe we'll circle back to, um, well, no. Start in the parents' room, I suppose? Yeah, might as well. Okay. So, yeah, mom and dad's room. So, looking around, um, purse, keep an eye out for other things I might have missed. Yeah, dad's got a Bible by his, um, desk, but as we've kind of discussed, the family's not actually all that religious. Like, they go to church, but that's about it. <laughs> Mrs. from Katie. Unknown Dimensions Literature. Okay. Kaz Publisher. Yeah, this is, you know, the publisher he ended up going to for his reprints, and I didn't realize that they have, like, they imply that early on. And this is another thing, like, if you found this before, this might actually be, like, a weird detail. Uh, looking back on it, maybe there really was not any, like, um, sinister details I missed. <laughs> like, you know, again, when I first played, for some reason I remember, like, the lead-up to finding out, like, Sam and Lonnie's relationship being scarier. Like, I thought, like, you know, there were implications more, like, Sam was trying to, like, lead Lonnie into something dark, and, you know, they're just into occult stuff, and it's totally fine. What? The life cycle of the oh. condom. Oh, barf. <laughs> Kate, the put that down. The life cycle of the condom All right. by is, Carla Zamanja. Is as follows. Uh, initially, we, the... Uh, condom was a separate plot point. It was an actual plot point. Um, <laughs> we gave it to uh, Lonnie, and we had Sam find it in Lonnie's purse, and it made Sam worried. Um, uh oh. About what the hell she was doing with it, etc. And uh, that was uh, sort of a wedge to drive them apart when that was the storyline, which it no longer is. Uh, and because we decided we hated it. <laughs> yeah, um, it would have been unnecessary. But, uh, I had already made the um, the condom asset, uh, which I'm actually really proud of. I really like that condom. <laughs> it's really good. Um, also, I think Nero is a really good brand for condoms. Anyway. Uh, yeah, it's a play on Trojan and everything, yeah, but it obviously. works. And... But it's, you know, it's the whole, like, uh, notably decadent, you know, right, it's like, yeah. it's per anyway, I like it. I'm, yeah. pr I'm proud of this thing. Uh, the, so the specular on it looks really nice. <laughs> that's not good. I don't know. So yeah. we, we had this, you know, extra asset lying around, and... <clears throat> and we were like, we were, we were all, oh, it's a shame that it's going to waste, but, you know, whatever, sometimes things don't get used. And then we remembered the horror of digging around in your parents' drawers and finding their condoms and stuff <laughs> and being just utterly fucking horrified. And uh, we decided we'd give that to you, the player. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm not going to comment farther on that idea. <laughs> um, anyways, moving on. So, yeah, and again, looking through, you know, more of their stuff. Bridge in the River Kwai, Silence of the Lambs, more of Dad's movies, and then Mom's movies, you know, uh, let's see. I'm trying to read that. Wait, Jeopardy? Uncle, oh, they had somebody on, relative on Jeopardy. Sound of Music, yeah, Mom's movies that are all handwritten in, you know, her very, like, you know, decadent script. So that's cool. And again, it just goes into how much detail there actually is in the game. Every character has, like, distinct handwriting and personality. It's so cool. Okay, anyways. Wait. Oh, checkbook and... Okay. Just very confused. Couldn't pick anything up. Binder... There's more nodes, I'm just double-checking and looking at stuff. All oh, right, I pulled out her damn book, you know, her damn, uh, bookmark again. Forget it. Throw it on the ground. I throw it! Wait, hold on, gotta pick it up. I throw it on the ground! <laughs> Sorry. Uh, oh yeah, Mitten, which must have been their old cat, and we found, you know, Mitten 
the collar they had in Sam's room. And, whoops, no, 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 I'm sorry, Mitten. Aw, oh, Mitten. Sorry, Mitten. Just still looking, and then this node. One of my favorite things that came out during development was someone uh, wrote an email mistakenly referring to Mittens, and Steve replied in the voice of Katie, saying, It's just Mitten. She's only one cat, Mom. I love that so much. <laughs> Uh, okay, what else is there? Just looking around a little bit more, trying to be extra thorough. Whoops. Any more commentary nodes? There's a trophy for finding all the commentary nodes, and I don't think the modifiers we've added will mess up, you know, some of our other things. So, you know, trying to get a couple of our trophies. I'm not trying to 100% this. I'm not going for the speed run. But again, the fact that you can speed run this and they acknowledge that is really cool. <clears throat> Another board game. Uh, this one wasn't done by me, though. This one was done by Carla. Yeah, but I really like it because the ghost figures on the back of the game are actually the long deceased family members of mine. Oh. Um, when I was home at Christmas, I was digging through my family's basement, sort of getting an idea of what a, a basement has in it, um, just sort of for set dressing purposes. And while I was down there, I found a big box that my family actually hadn't seen. We got a big box of things from my grandmother after she passed away. And inside this box was all these tin types, um, love letters and, and, and um, sort of Oops. immigration papers and notes from as far back as the 1850s when my family had emigrated from Scotland and Ireland. And um, um, I asked my family if it was possible that I include these in some sort of artistic project, and they said, sure, they gave me their blessing. And I scanned them, and I didn't know if they were actually going to make it in the game, but um, then I saw the Carla had made the scan, and uh, really that they showed up as, as ghosts in the box. Um, and it's, it's sort of, uh, I think, a nod, of, nod for idle thumbs who uh, really feel quite passionately about uh, ghosts, as it turns out. Surprise! That's interesting. Oh, look, a ghost came. It actually, like, fidgets in a weird way. There's actual ghosts in there. It's Kate's family. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a creepy, that's a little macabre detail, but that's very interesting. <clears throat> just looking around and yeah and you know appropriate to have like you know a ghost board game when this place feels haunted so oh yeah this is great density in the house and there would be in a real house like if you look around your house there's just junk piled everywhere probably <laughs> like it's just our house. i think it's most house oh, yeah. um, oh matchbook <laughs> but uh so you know our strategy was oh you either Fully uh, in something and you know put like a plausible representation of this aspect of a room in or you just don't put it in at all and the player will fill in the gaps between like oh these are all the things that represent the kind of room i'm supposed to be in and it doesn't jump out at me that there's no toilet plungers in the bathroom or, or whatever but the biggest mm -hmm. instance of this that i think actually totally works because no one has ever called yeah, it out is surprise think about it there are no shoes in this house Da -da. <laughs> Where's your uh, brain now? <laughs> and, and I don't think anybody's noticed it, and yeah. I think it's because if we had put one pair of shoes or two pairs of shoes, people would have said, where are all the rest of the shoes? Right. But really, to have a plausible house, Mom would have to have ten pairs of shoes and her work boots, and Dad would need to have some tennis shoes and some work shoes and so on and so forth. So we just said, there aren't going to be any shoes, and we hope nobody notices. That's fair. I certainly didn't. But yeah, okay, that's a funny little detail hidden behind here is Rick. And that's one of um, Jan's co-workers. And that's another thing I read up on is that yeah, I didn't pick up on it at all. But, you know, even though there are probably some obvious um, hints that maybe, you know, the wife is having an affair with one of her co-workers. And, you know, <clears throat> distant husband who's like, you know... Um, alcoholic writer and just getting more distant and distant, especially when they move into this house. And, you know, she works, uh, her drive is like an hour away, I remember they mentioned. So, like, two hours of commuting, you know, out in the wilderness with other people. So, yeah. And I'm not sure if eventually um, Terrence figured it out. I don't remember what I read. But... <clears throat> you know, that's still, like, tragic when you really think about, like, how the family falls apart. And, you know, they can't be that religious if infidelity is, like, something they can get past. 
and then opening up this secret passage, which, yeah. And interesting little detail here, you know, again, it's also really weird when you think about, you know, this secret passage, It considering the cobwebs, you know, the only people that have been down here were um, uh, Sam and, um, oh my god, what's her damn name? I don't know why I just completely blanked on the girlfriend's name. Lonnie, sorry. Um, <clears throat> you know, they're the only ones who know about this. But, you know, this must have been here for Oscar. So why are all these, you know, oddly specific pictures, you know, here? And also I didn't notice there's a cross over there. I'm waiting for something to happen. Yeah, then the light goes out. Which I've heard some people say, like, oh, there's a light that goes out and it's a jump scare. But that's the one? I would have been terrified if I had not known about this. But, yeah, I figured this out because of a node somewhere else that the commentary track goes. They talk about, like, random sound effects and events. And, you know, the sometimes when you hear your footsteps loud and clear on certain areas and surfaces, or when um, uh, lightning strikes or, like, weird cricketing noises happen, it's all random and set to like different intervals except for this this little when you look at the cross it triggers that light to break so that's a really cool little detail that scares the crap out of people <clears throat> so yeah just like this little hall you know set up here that's the interesting thing though is you know oscar why do you have so many like hiding places and little things we're getting to that. <clears throat> Even the footsteps I'm hearing right now scaring the crap out of me. Uh, yeah, randomization, this is it. Almost none of the events, the little events in the game, are scripted um, as far as, like, triggering when you do something specific. So... All of the thunder and lightning and the creaky noises in the house, um, they're all just randomized on timers. Um, the only, like, scripted, scripted thing is in the um, secret passageway when you look at the crucifix. There's scripting that detects that you did that and then it causes the light to, to pop, um, which is, the yeah, my one indulgence of, like, messing <laughs> with the player. Um, but we've had a lot of people play the game and say, you know, oh, the way you scripted it so that right when I walked into the TV room there was that big thunder and lightning strike, like, that that was really spooky, or, or you know, I walked through that one door and then you played that sound behind me, and it's like, <laughs> it's awesome that the combination of all the different kind of, like, significant actions you can do in the game, right. like crossing into a new room or opening a door or this, that, or the other thing, and the randomization of, of stuff can make it seem like the random elements have extra significance to them, but in fact, it's like, you just got lucky, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Because, like, yeah, it's just, because uh, there's, yeah, there's enough random things going on, and you can do enough things that eventually some of them are going to line up, yeah. which is, you know, cool. Yeah, so that's a really cool detail, <clears throat> you know, and it's super effective. This keeps scaring me, even though I know there's nothing here. Um, yeah, anyways, yeah, little, you know, Lonnie showing off, like, what she knows about, like, the military and, like, what the badges mean. And there's supposed to, there's a trophy I remember reading that open up, like, you know, open up this passage from this side. But I'm not sure. Is like a code here or something I'm missing? I'll have to look into that real quick. But let's move on a little bit more. Nothing much in Katie's room. <clears throat> I should also, like, go back to look up, you know, the next... Richard, that must be Rick. That's why she gave him the glowing review. Oh boy. <laughs> Potentially. <clears throat> the Phantom Violin. Okay. I just gotta go back and look at my list. Double check to make sure I'm finding all her things. Sometimes you just have to lie to mom and dad. Like when Lonnie asked me to see a band with her and stay over at her friend's place in the city after. That's a lie to mom and dad situation. 
But it was so worth it. The girls on stage were just so loud and real and awesome. And everybody was moving together like one huge tide of sound. Between two songs, Lonnie leaned over and said, How do you like your first show? I was so happy. I felt tears starting in my eyes. And then she oh. up and hugged me. Sorry, just really listening to them, but that. also we heard that one before. Um, I have to say it was pretty exciting to find the Heavens to Betsy tape, you know, because that was really, I mean, those songs really did come out on a cassette tape at the time. And <laughs> that really was how people discovered the music was, was getting a cassette tape passed around. Um, nice. So getting to put it in the actual tape player and play it and listen to our song, um, it definitely gave me chills. I mean, it was like, wow, you know. How exciting for a young person today just to get that that moment of discovery um, and to listen to our music. I, mean, it's, I think it's great. Can I put the... I was wondering if I could put the tape back in the thing. The tape almost looks too big for the cassette. Yeah, it's too big. Whatever, it's fine. <laughs> just a little detail. That'd be great. It's like trophy, like put all the cassettes back where they belong. Healthy choices. Yeah, so this was like mom's study, I think. So that's why she's like, yeah. Mom studies, so she was trying to get into painting. We saw her watercoloring book. And, you know, flowers been sitting there for a while. If the petals are starting to die. <laughs> Did I miss this? Or then things really heated up. Yeah, mom being dissatisfied. <laughs> Uh, okay, the wildfire book. Oh, man, look at this thing. Yeah, I, uh, this was another one of those situations in which I totally felt like a weird creepo when I was doing research. <laughs> and there was a lot of, uh, really horrifying romance novel covers. Uh, this poor guy, um, was on somebody's Flickr account, uh, that was, um, allowed, that was, a uh, Creative Commons attribution licensed. Um, and, uh, I think he was playing volleyball or something. Uh, and, um, I don't know. So I, you just put suspenders yes. on him and put an axe in his hand, and now he's a fireman. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's the I best. did it, and I will cop to it, and I do it again. Um, also, uh, as I recall, because I'm a noob, I initially picked total bondage suspenders. That's true. I, I wanted you actually... so you had started working on it, and I went upstairs, and then I came back down. And, like, Yara and, and I were like, you know, look, we're all like, hmm, what should we do for this And thing? I was, and I was like, like yeah. those are fucking leather daddy suspenders. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? And what I should have said is, damn it, he noticed. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually see, like, how it's, like, it doesn't quite fit. <laughs> like, that you can just see how they're, like, edited on. Oh, boy. <laughs> I think I completely missed that, did I? Oh, jeez. Oh, this is so good. Okay, 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 um. Let's see. Attic. So we gotta get the attic key, even though I know where it is, but we're coming to that later. Uh, hold on. I'm gonna quickly look up Katie's room. Uh, hold on a second. Just a second. Hold on. Sorry, I'm trying to find, um, guest room passage. Oh no, come on. Just a second, sorry. Trying to do this quick. There's no need for me to get these trophies, but I just want to, and I'm... Just trying to find... Come on, show me the tro achievements. Oh, come on. Okay, one side I found. What? Hold on a second. I just stumbled upon something.
Is there alternate endings to this? Sorry. I'm trying to figure out how to open, like, this passage real quick. And I'm... Wait. You can see the seam. Wait, did it open? Kind of open. Come on. Okay, it's fine. I think I glitched through it. Uh, is there a secret way to do it? No, I'm just looking. Apparently, there's. Uh, God, freaking lightning. Apparently, there's a thing called Mitten's Journal Entry. And I see, thought, saw that trophy, but apparently, that's a thing? Uh, hold on. <clears throat> okay. So, sorry, trying to get back on track. We found the basement key a while ago, so let's head down there. And that's where the real big thing comes into play. So, moving on. Okay, as we're walking through, sorry. Just going on tangents, finding stuff. Just a second, I'm looking at something real quick. Oh, wait, hold on a second. Hold on, hold on. Okay, I now found, like, a thing. Okay, hold on, hold on. Sorry, I'm just reading some stuff. Now I'm scared. <laughs> okay, hold on. Figured it out now. Katie's room. Real quick. Sorry, I'm also trying to find, like... There's no point for me going for trophies, but it's just fun. There it is. Okay, that's the button. 1963. Oh, damn it. I didn't want to find that. But, uh, shoot. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. There's a whole th trophy for, you know, because there's a safe in the basement that I did not unlock, and I completely forgot about until, like, I thought about the game some more. It's like, what could possibly be in there? Like, what else is the story? And then, you know, after doing some reading of, like, some stuff I missed, you know, it really fills in, like, the blanks about the family. So, okay. Anyways. Oh, by the way, you know... That must be, like, the portrait plaque that Katie made. And Mom and Dad put it up, so they seem happy with it. Um, you know, shop teacher. Okay, anyways. So, we're finding some stuff as we go here. So, just give me a second. I'm looking at trophies and things I could do. Okay. Sorry, we're going here. I messed up. Doesn't matter. There's one trophy if you can open the safe without, like, finding the... There's a way to find the combination, but that confirms it. Um, but, you know, not necessary. Composing the ambient exploration tracks definitely ended up being the weirdest part of creating music for Gone Home. The audio diaries tended to take precedence since they had such clear criteria for completion. So the ambient... Oops. It's different now. I mean, we still hang out all the time like before. I think we've seen this one. But now when no one else is around. Okay, yeah. Composing the ambient exploration tracks definitely I feel like I'm missing something. part of creating music for Gone Home. The audio diaries tended to take precedence since they had such clear criteria for completion. So the ambient tracks were the last things I did. I spent so long immersed in the logs, which are very specifically timed, uh, that to suddenly shift gears to creating these slow, standalone five-minute pieces was surprisingly difficult. I remember giving Steve a first stab at the ambient track for part two of the game, and I didn't hear anything back about it. When I eventually asked if he had any feedback, he said something like, Oh yeah, it's great. I just slowed it down by 50% and it totally works. <laughs> Which cracked me up. Uh, because I definitely didn't have that in mind. <laughs> um, but that's one of the great things about collaborative work. Uh, so I just went with it. I ended up doing a number of further revisions where I'd alter elements of the original version, uh, specifically to affect how the 50% slowed version would sound. 
It was definitely a new experience for me, writing bits of music and trying to imagine how they would sound after it's been considerably distorted. It got weirder though. The ambient track for part one ended up being a backwards version of the slowed down part two track. And again, there were elements that sounded good at 50% slow forwards, but not at 50% slow backwards. So again, I went back to the original track and started altering elements so they would sound better at half speed in reverse. Um, I don't know if that's a thing ambient composers end up getting used to, but for me, it definitely felt like going down the rabbit hole. All right. And yeah, looking back at these again, and you know, looking at, you know, some of Katie's stuff, first place ribbons, and you know, we see her trophies upstairs. You know, she's like the model, you know, model kid. She's the stereotypical girl, I guess you could say. And Sam is like the deviator, the rebellious instigator. One of the uh, larger assets that we needed for the basement to really give it character and personality was a furnace. And uh, when we were initially thinking of the furnace, Steve had mentioned to me the furnace from uh, Home Alone, which if you're from... Of course uh, they did. grew up in the 90s like I did, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so I did a lot of research mm. and uh, looked up stuff that could kind of evoke a similar feeling. And we finally settled upon octopus furnaces, which are like um, they're f uh, thematically... And um, time-wise, very appropriate. Uh, they're these giant, hulking monstrosities with all these arms covered in asbestos. Uh, really <laughs> perfect. So we ended up modeling one of those and put it in the corner. And I think it turned out okay. Yeah, and so that's one of Oscar's old books because you know it's one detail he owned a pharmacy. Reed College. Yeah, so she was accepted into a place. It's so stupid sometimes. I was telling Lonnie that I got into my college summer program thing, and I was all making plans like, you should come visit me, stay in my dorm room. But she said, Sam, I ship out on June 6th. I was like, ship out? To where? Military! Sorry, just going over stuff. So two things. Uh, one, mom's Canadian. Yay! Did two, I miss this? Mom didn't start out Canadian. <laughs> Oh. Um, the reason that mom is Canadian is because, uh, Kate Craig oh. and Emily Carroll are Canadian, and Did I completely miss that? In, uh, I remember seeing this no, but I didn't see that envelope. In, in the That's development interesting, though. Emily did mom's <laughs> handwriting. Um, this is before uh, she did any of the UI text or anything. Right, and it was before we decided that all the moms were going to actually be written by moms and all that kind of huh. stuff. Um, integrity in moms. And and so uh, we had we had the um, the answering machine note in the foyer, and there what the the line what's the actual line that's there? It's like um, neighborhood. Right. Yeah. yeah. So so the the line on the thing is like Daniel from the old neighborhood called call him back, and we gave the text to Emily and she wrote it out longhand and gave it back to us and then I looked at it. I realized that she had inserted a U into the word neighborhood. Because it's what you do. Uh, because of being Canadian. And so to fix that bug, <laughs> instead of removing the U, I said, bug fixed. Mom is now Canadian. <laughs> All right, perfect. Okay, sorry, going over some stuff as we go. So, yeah, it was, and I kind of did not, I glossed through it very quickly, but yeah, this is the note from... Terrence's dad, Richard, who, you know, is very condescending about, like, his books. Like, I read it. It's not that good. You can do better than this. Like, it even says at the bottom, you can do better, which is what's written in um, Terrence's study on, you know, his little crazy board. So, you know, that's condescending, and that's, you know, Richard is, like, this big, like, professor and, you know, doctor or PhD doctor, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so he's, you know, got such an important role, and Terrence can't live up to that. And, you know, um, Richard likes to remind him of that. So, tensions in the family, which I did not piece together for some damn reason. <laughs> Even though it's like the... Uh, things are so obvious. And then over here we got, you know, Oscar Mason's ph had a pharmacy um, in town. Soda fountain, whatever, yada yada yada. Where... Okay, I'm trying to think of where else. To, I'm trying to think of how to go about this because I know where to find stuff, and I'm just like, you know, we're getting there. Okay, here's something fun. So there's this little scrap of of paper that's hidden under this bedside 
table, um, and you start to read it, and then Katie makes you stop reading it. Um, and it was I got through quite a bit of it. It's it it's it's an exception to the interactive expectations that you have. Like it's one place, I guess, the one place where we really we really impinge on your ability as a player to do what you want and <laughs> Katie intervenes basically and it, it was this, it was something that I thought was an interesting little one off way of emphasizing the difference between the player and the character that they're playing as and to you as a player the note's just a note but a reminder that like Sam is Katie's sister and <laughs> Katie wouldn't want to read this thing and she's not going to keep doing it even if you want her to yeah, which I again I think is a funny detail because it's so like, okay, not reading any more of that. Yeah, it's just so like contrary to like everything else you've been able to do, and just like that like for a good reason is very like appropriate and in character for Kate. So yeah, now here's where things get dark. Hold on. Yeah, they actually got the pendant, which we've known, but, you know, just didn't see the receipt. Alright. That's fun and all, but I'll stop. Right, girl. You know, there, were, there was kind of this um, intellectual, cross-cultural, um, like, pen pal thing that happened before the internet. You know, we used to write letters back and forth to each other about our ideas and about how we wanted to change things. And um, so a bunch of these women that I mentioned came up with this idea of Riot Girl, of, of being a punk rocker that was also an in-your-face feminist. Yeah, I completely bypassed, like, the Riot Girl movement. I know that was a whole thing, and it just, like, it did not click that that's what actually was going on. But, yeah, so, you know, that was a whole musical movement. Okay, now here's the real dark thing. And this is, like... You know, I was reading through, like, the Wikipedia of Gone Home, just like, is there any, like, story threads I missed? And then I just, you know, some of the ones they detail, like, the affair on Jans, and then the background of Terry. And this is where it kind of, like, comes together. So, we already know the combination, it's, um, you know, what was it, 1963? And we can see, and I completely missed this, this is, like, Terry, you know, growing up in this home, cause, well, you know, visiting this home because it's his uncle's house. So they were measuring his age, or, you know, me uh, measuring his height and putting his age and the combination 1963. That's was on the paper we found, um, and that was on Thanksgiving Day. And so if we look at... Open that up. Lots of bottles. Hydrogen peroxide. Trying to get it to spin right. Oil of clove. Just a lot of stuff in here. Morphine. Lots of needles. And, you know, locked away in a safe and a tourniquet. I suppose that's the most obvious thing. So the pharmaceuticalist had a drug problem. But that's not all. Oh, God damn it! I can't read that. I'm trying my best, and I just cannot parse through that cursive. It's just so thick for me. But, okay, I read, like, what it's supposed to say, like, off screen you know, on a different thing, but this, I think it was Oscar, you know, writing to his wife, and it got returned to sender, because it never got to its location, but this is basically, like, an apology letter, kind of like, you know, Oscar saying, can you forgive me, I'll do better, if I can remember the exact details, and, you know, it's like, I should look up what it actually says, hold on a second, because, sorry, I cannot read that cursive, Just a second. All 
Okay, I can't find like the text, but okay, basically it's like it's an apology note. But for, you know, you can discern from this, drug problem, but that's not all. A little thing I glossed past is in this room. Lights don't work, and then there's this children's toy. And I completely glossed over that because I missed this stuff. But the implication, and this seems to be the consensus of people talking about it, you know, Oscar molested Terry, and seemingly at age 12 on Thanksgiving when the family was around. So, you know, start and stop that very day. It was not a long-going thing, but nevertheless scarring. And, you know, this also explains why Oscar became a recluse, you know, after so long, because everyone completely disassociated with him. And maybe that's where the drug problem came from afterwards, too. But still. And just learning that about Terry explains so much about him. And, you know, and, you know, it seems like, you know, the dad was not very supportive and helpful after learning about this. And either this is, you know, either this is Oscar's um, portrait of uh, his brother, or maybe that's just like Terry, like maybe just like in a fit of rage broke the picture of his dad. Because it seems like he's never been supportive, especially after that incident. And... These books, in which you personal, sh in which the personal shown needlessly clouded the genre cliches and implausible dime store science fictional Deus Ex Machina. Okay, but and but when you think about Terence writing several books about like going back in the going back in time to correct a mistake, and the last book, especially the third book, which is what was it called? The Accidental Warrior or something? Or at least that was the working title. But it was about, you know, the main character going back to save himself. John, what was it? John Russell is an analog for Terry. And god damn, that is so dark. And yeah, I didn't realize any of that even if I had opened that safe, I still don't think I would have figured it out. I might have figured out, like, oh, drug problem, and then that might have been, like, it. I wouldn't, because I can't read the cursive, I could not have, like, pieced it together further. Yeah, but, Jesus Christ, you know, again, Sam is the story that's told to you, but Terry has a story that's, like, buried underneath, like, all these different pieces in this house, and it's kind of heartbreaking. Because it explains so much about, like, his attitude. Because, you know, it wasn't bad enough that he was already, like, a failing, um, you know, failing writer having problems. But he's in this, he brought his family to this house that has so many bad memories for him. And it's just really messed up when you break it down. And, you know, maybe that's why the will is locked away. Because, like, you know... He's kind of ashamed to have this house. Maybe this was, like, Oscar's, like, attempt to try and, like, atone to Terry for, you know, everything by giving him this house in the will. But that certainly isn't enough. And also, it's... There's so much to say. It's just, like, you know... I, I made a point to say, like, you know, Terry... They tell you to stick hold that with thought. the group on field trips, Katie. There's a reason for that. Lonnie and I snuck off on the side paths at Multnomah Fall. Sorry. Back is the feature that I'm happy with. Now I don't want to interrupt these. And actually, so we'll get to them in a second. It's sort of a little bit of an accident. Um, Playtesters told us they didn't want to feel like some kind of horrible person rummaging around this house and tossing everything on the floor. There wasn't really <laughs> any other option initially. Um, that's all you could do was sort of try and lob things back into the place. Um, so, you know, I had done uh, some code before for placing turrets and things in other games where it, uh, you know, will arbitrarily orient an object to be perpendicular to surface and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, I told Steve that, you know, we'd have a lot of edge cases with that and it would take some time to implement. And uh, temporarily I would just give him the ability to um, put uh, objects that these things would kind of uh, stick to. 
um, in the game. And we tried that, and it worked so well that we decided to keep that. And that's uh, where Putback came from. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, how the Putback system, like, you pick up this book and it's facing up, but when you put it back, the letter's facing up. So you can see something you might have missed if you didn't rotate the book. But anyways, going back to Terry, but it explains a lot about, like, him as a person. And I remember saying, you know, the mom and dad are not just, like, you know, one-dimensional bigots just because they don't, you know, they're not supportive of Sam and Lonnie. Because they have more layers than that. You know, the mom has, like, a successful job. The dad is, like, a failed writer who's going through iterations. And he finally gets, like, a second chance for his, like, books to find the proper popularity he always wanted when he kind of signed up with, like, this mystery occult um, publisher. And so, like, they had, like, progressing arcs. But then you go through, and I notice, like, these other stories, like, other tensions that the family had. Like, The Affair... Um, and now learning, like, about Terrence's history in this house, it explains a lot, like, about, like, maybe the bitterness he had. But also another thing, and I thought it was weird at first, but when you really think about it, the family did not dislike Lonnie. Like, not really. Because their, you know, notes, even after Sam came out to them about Lonnie, you know, Terrence had, like, some strict words and writing but after, as time went by he was just like you know we're going on we're going off we'll see you later we trust you here's some money take care of yourself and you know even in this very strict worded worded note about Lonnie it's just like when Lonnie comes over you keep the door open as opposed to like you know a worse family would say like you're not allowed to see her anymore and they still let her hang around they still let their kid you know they still let Sam and Lonnie, like, see each other. They were just, like, against the idea of the romantic angle, and they didn't want to risk it. But they liked Lonnie. They weren't against her being in Sam's life. And maybe after a little more time, maybe they could have been more accepting of the idea. They just needed more time. And as we've seen, they're really not that religious. They're not that conservative compared to Lonnie's family, as we've learned. And even then, maybe they could have been lenient too. But, you know, Lonnie and Sam, you know, teenagers in love, their judgment's a little bit fogged up. And so, you know, when they ran away together, maybe that was just like their impulse kicking in because they didn't think anyone would give them the chance. But maybe they would, giving a little more time. And I must have missed this. And yeah, Mason ended up like, giving up his pharmacy to somebody else. And I can't remember when he died. That's also another really messed up thing when you really think about it, is that, you know, Lonnie and Sam are into the, um, you know, occult ghost hunter stuff, and they're, and they're unknowingly trying to contact, you know, um, they're unknowingly trying to contact, uh, you know, Terrence's abuser. And they don't know that. You know, nobody knows this thing. It's so guarded. And, you know, you have to do a lot of digging and, you know, really think critically in order to, like, piece this together. And it's really sad. And again, I appreciate Gone Home more and more because there are so many more hidden details. And it's just like, there is so much here in this house. You know, there's a lot the game doesn't really tell you. But what's hidden underneath that you can only understand by interacting with the world, it's very interesting. There was a little bit of concern on my part before any of this got started that you never know how much liberty you're going to be given and how much over direction you're going to get because somebody hears it like a specific, specific way and if you deviate from that at all, it, you're just going to keep doing the line over and over and over again 50 times until it's right. So I really wasn't sure what to expect, but even on the first day getting in there and being able to go through a few of the lines and just give them what came to mind and seeing how closely I think everyone was on the page about it. So the direction was always really positive and it was always kind of um, coming from either additional information that changed the context of what I was reading or a certain change in the phrasing or the way something is being, you know, a pause here or maybe move it to here or instead of emphasizing this word, try this one instead. So you end up with a lot of different takes that really give it a very different feeling, depending on which one you go for. Yeah. And also stuff like this, you know, maybe even the parents, you know, just like, 
you know, were more upset, like, you know, Sam acting up and causing problems at school because she was hanging out with Lonnie, not necessarily the fact that they were, you know, romantically get involved. Lonnie sometimes. Like her it's just, you know, when those two things NRC intersect, you think, like, oh, it's one thing. Everything are all anti authority. But I watch her in JROTC, and she's doing drills in perfect formation, following orders, no question. And there's all this stuff in the news about don't ask, don't tell. Like, she's going to join the army and then have to lie about who she is. She said they don't need to know what they don't need to know. Like, it was no big deal. This from the girl who trashed her locker to, like, defend my honor. I've learned when to stop arguing, though. I don't think Lonnie even gets Lonnie sometimes. Yeah, that, like, connect contextualizes them. Like, even they're both a little bit confused, but the way it works. Fanzines, I mean, that's one of the things that we started doing right away, was doing these Riot girl fanzines, and everyone would contribute and write, um, you know, an article for it. Um, and then we'd compile it and make these Riot girl fanzines, and <laughs> we would mail them out to people. I mean, I'll, you know, all this is so funny to talk about it before the internet, but... but um, you know, we used the mail and people would write, you know, we had a P.O. box and we started getting letters because people would um, read in someone else's fanzine, there's this Riot girl thing that started happening, right? And um, it just, I mean, I, it was the most incredible thing. It just snowballed. It just, people just, girls wanted to be a part of it immediately across the country. Right, so for the time we started Heavens to Betsy in 1991, I think it was only a year later, right? So one year of Riot Girl meetings and these letters happening and these fanzines happening. Well, a year later we left on the Riot Girl tour, the Heavens to Betsy Rat Wheel Riot Girl tour from Olympia to DC. Well, for some reason it took us like almost five weeks to get there on this tour. And we ended up staying in DC another something like five weeks before the Riot Girl convention that happened. So that all of this, you know, all of these fanzines, all these girls across the country started getting interested in Riot Girl, and the press just went bananas. I mean, the press attention was off the hook. New York Times, USA Today, all these journalists wanted information and wanted to, to interview all of us. Um, and it was, it was just, it was, yeah. It was crazy. So by the time we got to the Riot Girl convention, suddenly we were truly part of a movement. That's cool. Again, it's very interesting how, like, you know, this is a very, very realistic story, and I made the point, or I talked about that, but it's so, like, interesting how they got the commentary from, like, you know, real musicians and, like, real movements at the time that I don't know nearly enough about. The music for Gone Home was mainly composed over two separate periods, roughly a year apart. A version of part one of the game had to be ready by October 2012 for submission to the 2013 Independent Games Festival, so I did all the part one audio logs primarily that September. The following summer I did another round of logs for the second half of the game, as well as some part one revisions in the ambient exploration tracks. One really nice side effect of the long gap between composition sessions, as well as the structure of writing music that is very literally accompanying the story, was that I ended up hitting on pretty different ideas and approaches over time as I got further along in Sam's story. The original sketches I did had mainly electric piano sounds, which are warmer and more naturalistic than synthesizers and other electronics instruments. As Sam and Lonnie's story developed more though, I started to bring in acoustic guitar as well. It seemed like an appropriate way for the music to build up some more familiar natural elements, somewhat echoing Sam coming into her own. Yeah, Eventually it that's became appropriate. a really tonal element of the score. After that emerged, I started to more carefully control the instrumentation for the various main categories of log subject matter, uh, including Sam's self-reflections, Sam and Lonnie, Sam and her parents, and even Sam and Daniel. Some of those have their own melodies and themes as well. That wasn't really a grand plan from the start, and I, I don't expect everyone to really notice it, but it became one of my favorite things about working on this score. That's cool. It's like very introspective and going through everything. Ellen Espanol. Going through, yeah, mom's, more mob stuff. Hold on, there's another thing I wanted to point out about Lonnie and the family. Uh... Oh, yeah. Didn't really register, yeah, this was, like, mom's thing. And maybe this was her getting ready for her date. 
with, you know, Rick or something. So that's, you know, interesting. Yeah, I'm talking about, you know, the tensions. Yeah, and there are some things, at least from what I found, maybe I'm misunderstanding, since um, Lonnie and her dad are, like, working on a motorcycle. It seems like they get along. I like to think. But another thing I want to point out, though, real quick. Um, you know, again, I think, you know, the Greenbrier parents actually do like Lonnie to a degree, because it was Lonnie who picked up... Yeah, wasn't it Lonnie who picked up the skull? Am I misremembering? Shoot. I'm trying to remember, because I thought... God damn it. I'm trying to remember. I want to say this so confidently, but maybe I'm wrong. Just looking. Hold on. Yeah, Psycho Christian... Yeah, so, you know, the mom is, like, very frivolously religious, but the dad is, like, a little more lenient, it seems to be, just, like, military. But, you know, it seems like Lonnie having the necklace, she does have faith of her own, but it's not as, you know, aggressive as her mom seems to make it. And goddammit, I can't remember. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I thought it was Lonnie who bought this skull. I could be wrong, or maybe that was Kate, and I'm just not paying attention. But if it was Lonnie, you know they would, like, keep a souvenir from Lonnie just, like, in the living room, you know? And, yeah, it's just... <sighs> Again, there's a lot more depth to the parents than just, like, you know... So earlier in... In an earlier version of the story in Gone Home, um, Sam and Lonnie got caught together, and Lonnie's dad was an asshole about it and threatened to send Lonnie to live with her mom in Florida um, and we cut that it was too melodramatic and it wasn't really interesting it was an external force that yeah. was acting on them which I wasn't super excited about in practice and so on and so forth but um, it, it caused there to be this concept of Lonnie's mom living in Florida <laughs> which <laughs> Florida, yeah. Florida is, of course, the worst place you can live. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's not <laughs> assume. But um, that said, it's like it's the other side of the country, and it's totally yeah, you yeah, know yeah, yeah. so foreign from from Oregon and everything. Also, it's where I grew up. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> so I that's the that's the so yes. The reason I think that that Lonnie's mom lives in Florida is that I grew up in Florida, and I moved from Florida to Oregon when I was like 19 and I've been back to visit but you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if someone were to say to me hey Steve do you want to go back and live in Florida I would take a sheet of notebook paper and I would write no on it as big as you can get and With hand it back stones. to you <laughs> there would be knives there would be yeah. gravestones there would be Dead lightning yeah. uh, big X's in yeah. the eyes vampire teeth for some reason I was largely unfamiliar with Florida, and my family started going there every once in a while, or when I was like in high school for Christmas, because my mom hates being cold. <laughs> and, um, Pick the wrong goddamn place to live, Mrs. Zamanja. Yeah, well, you know. Um, but anyway, the only thing that I remember basically is that uh, everybody had lawn flamingos, and uh, we went around Christmas, so I remember hearing on the radio multiple times dogs barking Christmas carols. <laughs> That's Florida. Florida sounds cooler than I remember it being. <laughs> <laughs> In my head, that's Florida. Right there. Fair enough. Okay, so that was like an earlier version of the dad, but maybe they changed him up. I don't think they specified. We don't really know much about, you know, Lonnie's home life, except, you know, her and her dad work on motorcycles and our military, and the mom is very, like, you know, zealously religious. So, I don't know. We're already almost an hour in again, and we're still not done. <laughs> The coolest skull. Okay, it was at Lonnie. God damn. Why did my second guess myself? Treasure it always. Yeah, but you know, and the parents just like allow it to be on display. You know, it clashes with like, you know, it clashes a bit, but also like, you know, they're just like, oh, it's a nice little decoration. It's flowery. And so like, 
again, I do think the parents do, did like Lonnie. It's just when they started getting in trouble together, that's maybe where a lot of the tension came, and then also, like, the old-fashioned, like, ideals of them. But maybe they could have been flexible if given more time. I just don't know. That's just my assumption. But, again, the point I'm... The, at least I feel like the idea is, like, you know, they're not one-dimensional... The parents aren't meant to be, like, completely, like, one-dimensional, like, um, uh, you know, close-minded bigots or anything. They can't... They do have, like, their lives. They do have their, you know, ideals, and they do have their flexibility. Yeah, I didn't... Yeah, I didn't realize, yeah, this is... Must be, like, the show they went to. That might have been the date with Rick... Get away. There was something else I could grab. So that's why she dolled up herself and maybe... If they got a matchbook from a hotel, if that's what that was... All of the sliding doors that you see in the game are actually, from a code perspective, drawers. Uh, when that's actually really funny. Made a thing that could slide along a track like that um, for the purpose of making drawers. Uh, Steve took it and as designers are wont to do, uh, used it for his own purposes and uh, came up with sliding doors on you. All right, yeah. So just, again, it's also fun to like, hear like, the design process for like how this actually all works. Okay, I think we're gonna wrap up here for right now. This is going a lot longer than I meant it to, but this is exciting, this is really cool, like, you know, uh, you know, fleshing this out in some weird ways. Again, there's so much more to this to there it's so much more than just like a you know, there's much more to this than just walking. So okay, we're gonna wrap up here. Next time we continue we will finish up probably we'll probably like look at the last couple of rooms, find the commentaries, and I also got a list to try and find the rest of the um audio logs. And then there's one more thing. I'm now reading about that I want to check out. That's going to be real weird. Okay, so until next time, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Like and subscribe and all that. This is Tamara signing off.